All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Hosea, and we're going to do a little history lesson before we get to Hosea, because Hosea is a representative book of a big period of Old Testament history. Ezekiel, Daniel, and Hosea, so those are big old books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, so you ought to be able to find Hosea, and it's uh, several chapters, not as short as some of those uh, guys we call the minor prophets, minor prophets, because they just don't didn't produce as much material, not because their message isn't important. We are in week five of our walk through the Bible, and what we're doing is trying to get the big picture of the Old Testament story, and so we've been working on this for a while, and we, we do it in the sermons, we do it in our groups, and uh, we're, we're moving forward. Last week, we talked about how God evaluates us. Often, we evaluate God. We say, God, you're not doing a good job. That You fell down the job here. You need to do a better job with this. That's our prayers are, God, you're not, you need to pick up the pace. God evaluates us. I think it's something that a lot of believers forget, that uh, God's looking at us pretty hard, too. And the measure is his word. And there's a guy named Samuel. Samuel's a fascinating Old Testament character. He's the bridge between the judges, because they're this whole set of folks, men and women, who protect God's people, help to throw off foreign invaders, who guide them toward the Lord and back to the Lord. He's the last of the judges, and the first of the classical prophets, he's the last of the judges, and he's the guy that anoints the next two people who will be kings, the first kings over Israel. He's a key, key guy in the Old Testament, and the Bible says in 1 Samuel, as he was looking for that next king to replace the first king, Saul, he found David. And he just makes the comment, humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what's in, what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. God led Samuel to anoint David as king of Israel, and his life is summarized in the Bible this way. God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He'll do everything I want him to do. And so we talk about David. We see David had a, Saul had no heart for God. David had a whole heart for God. And then when David stepped out of the scene and Solomon took over, we find someone with a divided heart. And the reason that's so important is because now, for the next few hundred years, the divided heart is going to be the big obstacle that God's people are facing. Divided heart, divided heart, divided heart. Here's what happens with Solomon. Solomon didn't just desert his father. By the way, how many? I gave you the, uh, the FDA uh, pamphlet information, so I'm trying to be educational today. Now, we're going to step into history. How many of you like history? Okay, that's five of you. Good. Uh, well, we've got to do a little history because we're going to cover... A big chunk of the Old Testament, the period of the kings is, is what we're working on today. And, and the message that went out during that time period, and the kingdoms that are involved. And we're going to take a whirlwind tour of this because it really gets us to the applications in a clear, clear way in Hosea. Solomon became king. Wise King Solomon. He didn't desert his father David. He didn't desert the law of Moses. Uh, in fact, early on in his, in his reign, he is close to God. He's a, he's a man after God's own heart in so many different ways. But what happens, what happens in so many people's lives, he, he compromised. He just, like my illustration earlier, he just commingled his commitments. He compromised just a little here, a little there. He customized his religion. He did things that uh, God had declared, Moses had recorded in Deuteronomy 17, these are just things kings shouldn't do. Uh, because it's going to lead down a dangerous, destructive path for my people. And here's, here are the things that Solomon did. Solomon, he married a lot of foreign women. We're talking about women from these neighboring countries that God said, you do not need to, to mix and match with these people. They are going to pull you away from me. You need to avoid that that impact that, that will happen. They will draw your heart, divide your heart. But that's how kings did things in David's day and in Solomon's day. It's, it's you marry for military alliances. If you marry the daughter of the king of Moab, 
king of Moab is less likely to invade your country, less likely to go to war with you. And so he did this for military alliances. And so he has these foreign women that he's married to that brought with them their pagan religions. And this doesn't mean that Solomon didn't keep worshiping at the temple, didn't keep observing the Jewish holidays. But his wives said, well, where's the place? We're supposed to worship our God. And so he, he created places where they could worship their God. And then they said, why don't you come? I come to the temple. Why don't you come with me? Or, I, I, I acknowledge your holiday. Why don't you acknowledge my holiday, religious holiday? And the, there gets to be this commingling and a the diluted uh, sort of relationship to God because his heart became divided. He built up his army. He built up fortresses, his military might, just outstanding uh, and, and how he did it, how he organized it. However, when, when he did that, he came to rely not on God first, but on, well, I think I can handle this one myself. I have the resources. I have the army. I have the plan. And I don't have to put all my faith in God to protect me, to care for me, to, get, to cover our nation in peace. I can make it peaceful. And his heart was divided. He accumulated large amounts of possessions and treasures. And the more secure he was in what he possessed, the less he needed to rely on the Lord. And we see this around the world in cultures that are financially secure, that there's a safety net for how the world goes for you. You have your own resources to back you up. You don't have to rely on God for everything because you can rely on yourself and on what you have, what you bring to the table to keep, you, to keep you in good stead. And Solomon, he just drifted away from God. And the wisest man the world has ever known was just a big dummy when it came to commitment to God and faithfulness to God. Now, when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king. I have a, I have a little picture for you. My, uh, my pointer at various levels sometimes works. I guess if I pointed it toward the screen, it would be more helpful. There we go. Well, the screen just ate it again. We went through two other pointers in the first hour. And my life is just filled with disappointments. <laughs> Here's what happened. There's certain, there's certain dates you need to know about the Old Testament. First date, 922 B.C. Second date, 722 B.C. Third date, 586 B.C. Here's why those are important, because it covers the period of the kings. And in 922, Solomon died. His son, there at the bottom, Rehoboam, uh, he becomes king. And they have a, like a council that gathers, and they meet with him and say, we're, we're cool with you being our, our new king, following your dad. But, you know, your dad was he's kind of hard on us. And so if you could just ease it up a little bit, we will follow you. We'll be happy as a lark to be, be your people. Well, he asked for advice from some counselors, but he went with the bad counsel of his pals. And they said, oh, no, you don't need to do that. You need to ease up on them. You need to be harder than your dad was. Show them you're, you're really the boss. You're going to take what your dad did to the big extremes. Well, he told them that, and they said, well... That's just dandy. We're out. And this is the point where the nation divided between what is called Israel in the north. Sometimes in your Old Testament it's going to be called Ephraim. The first capital in Shechem. Eventually it's going to be Samaria for most of uh, this Old Testament journey. In the south you have Judah. And Judah with the capital of Jerusalem. There are only a couple of tribes. Judah is in the south. Benjamin is just down to just about nothing because of some things that happened in the period of the judges with them. So you got a couple of tribes, but mostly it's the tribe of Judah in the south. You have nine tribes that are in the north, plus the Levites, who don't have their own tribal territory. They're scattered all over because their inheritance is not just a, a land, a specific plot of land. It's to serve the Lord. They're the, they're the descendants of... Uh, of Aaron, who are the priests, the priestly tribe. So they're scattered throughout. But here's the deal. Most of them are in the north, in that group of tribes. So we usually say there are ten tribes 
in the north that break off. And there's a sprinkling of the Levitical priests, the Levitical families that are still in Judah. So they break off and they're going to do their own thing. Jeroboam, the top, by the way, those are their Facebook profile pictures where I got those. Jeroboam, he's already butted heads with Solomon. People know he's a strong leader. And so Jeroboam, he becomes the leader of those northern tribes that break off. And, but here's what, Jeroboam's not, he's a sharp guy. And he says, okay. And there's always, there was a north-south issue with them for a long time. Now it just blows up. Now you have two kingdoms. For the next 200 years, they're going to they're gonna be in conflict. Occasion of their pals, not often. Next 200 years. Well, here's the problem. Look at the problem. Jeroboam looks and he says, I got these, I, I have these people following me. They have, their heart has to be with me. However, if you got Jerusalem and they're always going to the temple to do their worship, that's going to undo everything I'm trying to do. And so I, I've got to do something to counteract that. I, I got I to gotta come up with a different plan. And so what Jeroboam does is he says, I'm going to create alternative places of worship. Instead of having to go back to Jerusalem, he went multi-site and he said, I'm going to have, I'm going to have a place of worship in Dan, more in the northern part of Israel's territory, and down in Bethel toward the southern part of their territory. And I'm going to set up places of worship where the people in the north can go to those two places to worship God. And he's still talking, it, at least somewhere in his mind. It's the same God, it's just a different place to do it. And also, I'm not going to use those Le- tribe of Levi guys to be my priests. I'm just going to use whoever. And uh, I'll create some religious holidays of my own, separate from you know, Passover and Day of Atonement and all that stuff that's happened in the South. <clears throat> I have to create some kind of unique worship to my people. Well... The Bible says he set up golden calves at each location. And he declared, Israel, here are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. He set up one in Bethel and put the other in Dan. And no less than 21 times in the Old Testament, his name shows up, Jeroboam, long after his family has been wiped out by God's judgment. And he's charged with having caused Israel to sin. He claimed to still love the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He still tipped his hat to the law of Moses, except where it was inconvenient or it was not politically expedient. And he's like a lot of people today. A lot of people today say, I love the Lord with all I can fit into my schedule, but I'm pretty busy. People today, you say, I obey the word of God absolutely, except for the times I don't. I follow Jesus until it makes me uncomfortable to do what he said, or it gets into my busy schedule. I'm a born-again Christian, and by that I mean whatever I want it to mean. I've defined that myself rather than God defining the relationship. Here's the thing about Jeroboam. Jeroboam thought, this is good politically. It's a good move. This will make us a strong nation. And it did solidify the nation, but it affected his family. You know, the choices you make spiritually are going to affect your kids. It's going to affect your grandkids and the generations that follow you. That's going to be true for all of us. So you you have to make good decisions. And, And then beyond that, the more influence you have, he's the king, the more it's going to reverberate out to devastate everything uh, that we touch everybody who knows us who's, everybody here has people you have people watching you if just your neighbors or the people you work with y- your friends and when you make a choice like this well I'm just going to customize my relationship to God just a bit it won't affect much oh it gets ugly kings in the book of first and second kings are evaluated, marked by the Lord in this way. And I'm just going to give you one example. There, again, these occur over and over again because every king usually say, and then this guy died and his son took over or another guy took over and then it tells about him. He either did what was right in the eyes of the Lord or he did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord. This is Baasha in the northern kingdom. 
Here's how he's marked by the Lord. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight and walked in the ways of Jeroboam. Uh-oh. He just followed what Jeroboam did. Those, those places of alternative worship in the north and south. The sin he caused Israel to commit. Now, there's some disagreement about how many kings there were. You, you, you start reading Bible commentaries on this period of time. And uh, because some of these guys, like, like three days. So, well, is he really a king? Do we count him? So there's a woman that's involved as a queen for a while. And she was ruling everything for a while. And so how many do you have? And so often it depends on where you went to school. Well, I went to school at Hardin Simmons where the dew falls first from heaven. And there... They say there are 19 in the north and 19 in the south. So that's what we're going to go with today. 19 in the north, 19 in the south. In the north, none of them followed God. They all fell short. They were a mess. In the south, somewhere around eight. And this, when it says they followed God, it's like some of them did it really well and some of them were, weren't really good at it, but they at least tried. So different levels of good king in the south. Now, good kings were not measured by their military might. He's a good king because the economy is great. Because really, in some of the darkest times spiritually, the economy was really, really good. That doesn't mean they were good leaders. Because they led to destruction ultimately. The question is, did they do what was right in the eyes of the Lord and follow in the ways of David? Or did they do what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord and follow in the sins of Jeroboam? And that's how all those 19 and 19 are going to get evaluated in the days ahead. God made his expectation clear in his covenant. During the time of Moses, he said, okay, here's what I'm expecting from you. And God makes it so simple. Obey and be blessed. Disobey and be cursed. And where a lot of the blessing and cursing is going to be played out is in the land of promise that I have given you. Obey and be blessed. Disobey and be cursed. The land is the laboratory where the blessing and the cursing start showing up. So that's how God's painted this picture. It's very simple. And that's uh, Deuteronomy 28 and 29. Uh, spell that part out. So that's 922. So from 922 to 722, we have a divided kingdom. And then because of, we've got another slide for you. There we go. The Assyrian Empire. And it wraps around, by the way, that's not a to scale map. It really fattened up on me. Uh, but it's that fertile crescent, follows you follow them. Egypt is down south on the left-hand side of your map, swirls around toward the Persian Gulf on the other side, and that's the Assyrian Empire, and those dotted lines are basically the territory that they covered. God, because of the repeated rebellion of the northern kingdom of Israel, Ephraim, those ten northern tribes, God allowed the, his judgment to fall and utilized, because God controls the, everything. These Assyrians think they're doing something. God's moving the nations. And here they come. And they come in and they take over those, those northern tribes. Samaria is the capital. It's a long siege, three years. But they finally, the city falls and everything else just drops like dominoes at that point. And the Assyrians destroy. By the way, what's the capital of Assyria? Nineveh. Thank you, you Bible scholars out there. Nineveh. Why does Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? Because the Assyrians are jerks. He hates those guys. Because they are evil and brutal in how they do things. And so the Assyrians come in, destroy the, take away the, the northern tribes. And what they do, it's a great plan because uh, if the United States is invaded, well, we're going to, this is my home, this is the ground I live on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play hard on the home field, right? I'm going to keep opposing. I'm going to be difficult. So what they did is they, take, they took those folks from the northern tribes, and there are a lot of territories they have torn up, they've taken over through that fertile crescent. Well, they just took people out of those northern tribes, and they put them on somebody else's dirt where they didn't have quite so much emotional investment. They just moved them around, and then they moved people from those lands into that area of uh, Ephraim, of Israel. Which is how you start getting this group of people who they kind of know about the, the law of Moses and kind of know some of the backstory, but they really don't buy into it and they've developed a lot of false teaching. And we see them in the New Testament as the Samaritans. It's going to happen with them. It's going to happen again when the Babylonians come for the southern kingdom. So they just, 
they just mixed and matched these people. So everybody going to live in fair, fair peace and they can control people better in a wide ranging empire. There's nothing left. This is when the 10 northern tribes got lost. And contrary to what some people believe, they didn't get found again. That's 722. Now the southern kingdom of Judah, now it's all that's left. Oh, we got a picture there, and that's the Babylonian Empire. It's going to reach all the way to Egypt uh, because they defeated the uh, Egyptians uh, at uh, Megiddo. There's another big battle at Carchemish, which is up toward the... Uh, you, you head straight up the edge of the Mediterranean Sea, and you're going to come up to Carchemish, the big battle in Carchemish in 605. At that point, the Babylonians have taken everything the Assyrians had, and now they're the power in charge. Well, you'd think, I mean, you have, you have kids at the house, you have two kids, and you have rules at your house, and one of them breaks the rules, and there's a punishment that's really clear, and you think, well, the other one's probably noticed that, right? But somehow they don't, and they'll do the exact same thing, and that's what you have with the northern kingdom of Israel. God showed his judgment. He, he said, this is what will happen if you don't obey me, you don't follow me, you don't do what I told you to do, and then God wipes them out. In the southern kingdom, they didn't learn that lesson well. And as a result, they are going to get, uh, they're going to get wiped out too. Now, the Babylonians came down and uh, they did this multiple times. The Babylonians, they're the power that be. And they're trying to, they don't want to destroy everything. They want to maximize their investment. So they're not wiping stuff out. But they come in, it's clear they have the military advantage in every way. And so, Jerusalem, which is the center for most of this, the king says, yeah, okay, we'll do what you want. And it's okay, well, give us money. Give us uh, tribute, uh, gold and silver and all this stuff. Pay us off. And we want some of your people to come back. We're going to grab some of your people. We're going to take them back to Babylon because we've got a big empire. We've got to develop a lot of leaders. So you probably have a few capable people in Israel. We're going to take, so they take... They take people who are good with skilled people. They have, they have a skill of some kind, and they take them back to Babylon. And some just with a lot of potential. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they get taken around the Fertile Crescent down to Babylon. And there, they, so this is how they get there. There are a couple of times that they're going to do that. They're going to come in. They're going to take away some of the best of the best. But here's what happens. In Jerusalem, they're just a thorn in the side of the Babylonians every time they turn around. And finally, they just say, we can't expend this much energy and this much military might just trying to manage you crazy people. And they come in. It's a brutal siege in Jerusalem. And uh, finally, they breach the walls. When they breached the walls, King Zedekiah, who's a real nut job, so far from God, he and his sons and key leaders, they try to escape toward uh, the plains of Jericho. And that's where Nebuchadnezzar's army caught up with them. And they executed all of Zedekiah's sons in front of him, and then they gouged out his eyes, so the last thing he would see would be his sons being killed. And they took him in chains to Babylon. Then they go back to Jerusalem, and they said, enough is enough. And they took the place apart. And so the way the Bible describes it is, there was not one stone left on another. They broke down the walls. They burned the gates. They burned the buildings. They leave just a handful of the poorest of the poor, is how Jeremiah tells the story, as an eyewitness to the events. The poorest of the poor. And at this point, they hauled off that group of people to Babylon. But there's a remnant, a faithful remnant among those people in Babylon. And they're going to be the ones that, after this exile of 70 years, they're going to come back to the land of promise again. With people like Nehemiah and Ezra, some of those guys start playing into the Old Testament story to rebuild, to repopulate, and to reestablish the worship of the one true God at their holy city, at their temple, as they begin to rebuild the temple as well. And so that's the period of the kings. Now, this is really simple. Obey and be blessed. Disobey and be cursed. But here's the, here's the part of the story that I want to focus on in our Old Testament journey today. 
in the north, in the south, none of these people should have been surprised by any of this. Because God didn't just leave them to guess. I wonder what God wants us to do. I wonder what direction we should go. I wonder what decision we should make. I wonder how we should structure our society and our religious beliefs. Because there is this ongoing, resounding chorus of voices during the period of the kings. And it comes from a group of people called the prophets. Now, when we think about prophecy, sometimes we think about it as, oh, well, that's uh, something's going to happen a long time from now. That is a very small, small part of the work of the prophets in the scriptures. The prophets didn't just speak to one of these days in a land far, far away. The prophets spoke about their time, their culture, their people, their sin. In that context, they were truth tellers. They spoke the word of God in the situations in which they lived. And they spoke about relationship to God. They spoke about relationship to others. You want to know what's important to God? You find a lot of it in those Old Testament prophets. Because see, they didn't just say, you ought, to be in the, you ought to be in the temple for worship days, and you ought to work, pray every day to God. And they also said, you've got to care about the poor. And they said that over and over and over again. You've got, to care, you've got to care about the widows and the orphans and the alien in your midst, it says. The, the people who weren't, weren't Jewish people, but they lived among them and had needs. They're refugees from them. You've got to care about all those people, too. You've got, to, you got to care about your business practices. There's a lot in, the, in these prophets about don't be dishonest in the marketplace. There are a lot of priorities that are established over and over through the prophets about how we're doing life horizontally, not just how we're doing life vertically, because all those things are on the heart of God. Some of the prophets were writing prophets, and you see those with a guy like Jeremiah or a guy like Isaiah. They're, uh, their stuff is being recorded. They're recording it, or they have assistants, uh, kind of disciples around them who are recording things. Some of these prophets are, are like... Uh, Elijah and Elisha. They're just big, bold voices, and we hear their stories in the books of the kings. Sometimes uh, you have somebody that shows up. He's not even named. It's just a guy who at a key point steps into a palace and says, here's what God says, and I don't care what the cost is. I'm going to declare the word of the Lord in my time in this situation. Uh, so a lot of variety to these guys. You're going to find uh, in the the 8th century, so this is leading up to the northern kingdom being destroyed. You're going to find guys like Isaiah and Micah. They're working down in the southern kingdom of Judah in the 8th century. You're going to find guys like Hosea and Amos. They're working, doing their, most of their work in the northern kingdom. Just call them one last time to repentance. One last time to turn back to God. Uh, in, by the time you get to the 6th century... You're dealing with several other prophets. One of those guys that's so prominent throughout that time leading up to the Babylonian exile is Jeremiah. And he has a lot of material and he speaks a lot of words in the worst of times to do exactly what God told him to do. Now, today I've chosen to share representative of this time period of the prophets during the time of the kings, this passage from Hosea. And our applications will be uh, quick and clear. I, Hosea chapter 7, verse 1. When I return my people from captivity, when I heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim, that's that northern kingdom, because that's who Hosea is focused on mostly, and the crimes of Samaria, that's the capital of the northern kingdom, will be exposed. For they practice fraud. A thief breaks in, a raiding party pillages outside, but they never consider that I remember all their evil. They think God's not watching. Now their actions are all around them. They are right in front of my face. They please the king with their evil, the princes with their lies. All of them commit adultery. By the way, when he says adultery here, we're going to talk about this in a moment. He's not talking about, I married somebody and... This lady's married to somebody, and we're going to have an affair together. Not that kind of adultery. He's talking about spiritual adultery. They're like an oven heated by a baker who stops stirring the fire from the kneading of the dough until it's leavened. Uh, that's a great word picture. They're like half-baked bread. They sort of have the appearance on the outside, but they're kind of mushy on the inside. 
On the day of our king, the princes are sick with the heat of wine. There's conspiracy with traitors. For they, their hearts like an oven, draw him into their oven. Their anger smolders all night. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven. And they consume their rulers. All their kings fall. Not one of them calls on me. Nobody's paying attention to God. They're struggling along just on their own, making it up as they go. Ephraim has allowed himself, this is verse 8, to get mixed up with the nations. Ephraim is unturned bread baked on a griddle. This time it's like a pancake. You cook one side and you, flip, and you never flip it over. They're half-baked. Foreigners consume his strength, but he does not notice. This is where we'll focus at the end. Even his hair is streaked with gray, but he does not notice. Israel's arrogance testifies against them. Yet they do not return to the Lord their God. And for all this, they do not seek him. So Ephraim has become like a silly, senseless dove. They call to Egypt and they go to Assyria. They're turning everywhere except to the Lord. This is, they, they think Assyria in the north. They think Egypt in the south are going to help them. As they're going, I will spread my net over them. I'll bring them down like birds of the sky. I'll discipline them in accordance with the news that reaches their assembly. Verse 13, woe to them for they fled from me. Destruction to them for they rebelled against me. Though I want to redeem them. Listen, I'll tell you, as pastor, I don't worry about most of you wandering away from the faith. Like you're going to cash out and say, well, instead of being a Christian, I'm going to become some other world religion, or I'm going to become an atheist. I'm really not that concerned about hardly anybody uh, making that call. And I don't worry uh, if you're going to slide away from Jesus because of false doctrine. There's a lot of false doctrine in the world. We always want to be aware of it. But that's probably not what's going to pick off most, most church-going, Jesus-following people. It won't be false doctrine. You'll, you'll perk up and you'll spot it. But based on what the Bible says, God's Word and the patterns that we see there, what's going to get you? What's going to knock you out of the game? What's going to distance you from God? Is not, I'm, I'm jumping off. It's going to be compromise, compromise, baby steps, baby steps, baby steps, until one day you say, I'm a long way from God. And, and it happened so easily and so quickly. And that's the way it happened through the period of the kings. They didn't just jump off the cliff. It was, it was baby steps away from God. Simple, slow, and destructive. It happens today. You know, it can be that simple thing of just, I just slept in a few weeks because on Sundays, because, you know, it was just hard. My calendar was full. I was overwhelmed. And then one day you wake up and you say, you know, my life, really, there's no discernible difference between my life, my next door neighbor who's a devout atheist and says they don't believe anything because we basically live the same life now. I'm a functional atheist, a functional non-believer. And that's a dark scenario, I know. But I'm telling you, I've been doing this for a long time, walking with people for a long time who identify or claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. And... That, that sketch I just drew for you, it's everywhere. It is everywhere. We, we know this, too, because we've been doing our community outreach, and we knocked, we've knocked on a lot of doors in the, in the city. And here's what we find in the city. We have a lot of people who used to go to church, used to walk with the Lord, used to teach a Sunday school class, used to sing and worship, used to do this or that or the other thing. And it doesn't mean they've abandoned it. I mean, they'll still show up. Uh, they'll be here, holidays. They'll, they'll, weddings and funerals. Building fills up with folks uh, who, uh, who get back into the building. There'll be times when they'll be around. But it's, it's not, there's nothing in their life that looks like following Jesus. Being a disciple. Uh, there, there, there's not anything, it's not abandonment. I want you to see that part. It's not abandoning the things of God. It's just drift and compromise and commingling and carelessness of commitment. And one day, it's just a long way from God. Hosea 
says the people's hearts, uh, different translations, it says their hearts are devious, deceitful, fickle, faithless. One translation just says their heart is divided. And that image runs through the prophets and it runs through the New Testament. You see it with Elijah. Elijah on Mount Carmel, he calls out to his own people, hey, just make a choice. Just decide something. Either follow God or just bail out. But do something. Get off the fence and quit pretending. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. No, we're happy just, just bumping along, just pretending. Just uh, like the, the character in uh, Pilgrim's Progress, Mr. Facing Both Ways. Mr. Facing both ways. I can do both at the same time and still be good. Jesus said no one can serve two masters. He'll either hate one and love the other. He'll be devoted to one and despise the other. The divided heart. James wrote about people being double-minded, unstable in their ways. Divided heart. Later in chapter 4 of James, James wrote this. You adulterous people. Again, he's not talking about people having sex with somebody they're not married to. He's talking about people spiritual adultery don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God so whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God here's why I wanted to use Hosea partly because of his own story it's such a graphic illustration of what James just said God's asked me to do some things that really took, made me uncomfortable took me outside of me but you know like Isaiah, he asked Isaiah at one point, to, as a ser- living sermon illustration, why don't you walk around naked for a couple of years? Oh, I'm glad God didn't call me to that. A lot of people probably are. With, with Hosea, he said, here's what I want you to do. Go marry a woman of promiscuity and have children of promiscuity, for the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. Now, I like the King James Version a whole lot better on that, on that verse because promiscuity, it tells the story, but it's just not as hard. The word uh, in, King, in King James, marry a woman of whoredom, have children of whoredom because the land is committing blatant acts of whoredom by abandoning God. So he says, I want you to go marry this woman, Gomer, which that should be your first clue. You don't want to marry a woman named Gomer. Marry a woman named Gomer. So he goes and he marries this woman named Gomer. And she is just, she's already a prostitute. But he, maybe I can, you know, a lot, a lot of people in their marriages, you know, I think I can make it better. I think I can reform a person. But she, she abandons him, abandons her kids. And it's just him as a single dad now. And she's just off doing her thing. And she continues down a path of destruction until finally she's on the slave block. And Hosea hears about it. What does Hosea do? Yeah, finally got what's coming to her? No. What does Hosea do? Hosea, and I love the way it is written in this book of Hosea as it describes it in those first few chapters of the book. He goes and the way, it just, it has a list. He just, scrape together everything he could scrape together to buy her back in spite of all of this it's it's like okay i've got i got twenty dollars in my wallet and uh, i've got some i got some bread over here and and i have i can give my watch and uh uh my shoes he just cobbles together an offer to be able to buy her back from slavery because he brings her home and in an act of incredible grace, we, we sang and read about grace early in the hour. In an incredible act of grace, he brings Gomer home again. And it's a living illustration of what God was trying to do with his own people. In spite of everything they had done. You get that, that glimpse of Christ on the cross buying us back to bring us home to God. In this book of Hosea, because we find so much New Testament in the Old Testament. In chapters 4 through 14 of Hosea, the prophet just describes how Israel has been unfaithful to God. And God wants them so desperately to repent and turn from their wickedness. He wants to restore them. And that's the story that we get throughout the divided kingdom. 
over and over the word of the prophet. Thus saith the Lord. This is what God is calling you to. And yet they continue to drift. Now, about this. We like to pretty up our sin, I think. I, yeah, I, yeah, all have sinned, absolutely. I believe that. Just my sin's not as bad as your sin. Uh, and I'm not seeing it the way, not quite so bad as God sees it. And so, it doesn't really count against me. All sin, the Bible would describe as spiritual adultery. In, in a marriage, think about it that way. In a marriage, how much faithfulness is faithful in a marriage? Well, you know, uh, 90 in schools, and A minus. I want to be 90% faithful to my spouse. How's your spouse feel about that? Not so good. Because 90% faithful is not faithful. In the FDA handbook, how much rat feces is okay in your food supply? I'm not good with any having any in my food supply. How comfortable are you with compromise? In Hosea 7, verse 9, another one of those great word pictures that Hosea gives, and there's a whole set of them in the book of Hosea. That's why I enjoy the book so much. It's so graphic in how he describes things. He describes this condition of backsliding or falling away from God, apostasy. We've heard stories about that recently. Prominent people say, well, I've been a Christian. I've been serving the Lord in these big ways, but I'm just giving it all up. I don't believe any of it anymore. Apostasy, just walking away from God. They say, his hair, this is what the prophet says, his hair is streaked with gray, but he does not notice. Ron is out of town uh, th this weekend. Uh, I get my daughter moved to a new place. And uh, this morning, I was going through the house. I woke up, going through the house. And man, there was an old man in the house. It scared me at first. And then I realized I was in the bathroom and looking in the mirror. And it was me. It was the old man that frightened me as I walked through the bathroom. You know, I, I recognize. I'm not pretending. Th this gray hair. Well, it says something about me. It says that my vertical leap isn't what it was when I was 20. It says that I can't run as fast as I did when I was 25. It's, it says a lot about me. And I don't deny that, okay, well, this is, this is kind of where it is. And I'm make, trying to make the most of it at this point in my life. But I'm not denying my age. There are a lot of things I just can't do anymore. And I'll take all the, all the discounts I can get because I'm also that guy. But what he says is, these people spiritually, they're, they're obvious signs of their spiritual condition. They're just ignoring them. They're pretending like they're not there. It's like they're going gray spiritually. There are obvious signs of their decline, their distance from God, and they're in denial about it. His hair is streaked gray, but he does not notice. And we should ask ourselves, are we going gray spiritually? You think about this, like the prodigal son story. The prodigal son, he grabs all his inheritance when it wasn't time for him to get it, and he goes off to the far country and squanders it all. And now he's in a distant, faraway country, and he's broken, and everything's bad. But a long time before he was the prodigal son in the faraway country, he was a prodigal son in his heart, divided, already stirring, things already spiritually going gray before he crashed and burned in the faraway country. That's true for us too. Now, okay, we're to the sermon. So now that was the introduction. Now we're going to start the sermon. I told you next Sunday's short because today's long. But this is going to go fast. Your outline's there, seven things. Now I want to run through these. And I have verse references for you. You can pick a lot of these out yourself. When it comes to that going gray spiritually, the first one is the gray hair of deceit. A lot of Christians are guilty of this. The last thing we want is to admit failure, that we're getting cold and lazy spiritually. And so we try to keep up appearances. We just lie to ourselves and try to lie to other people that, oh yeah, I'm still, you know, I got my big black Bible here and I'm, I'm all good. Not so much. Uh, it reminds me of uh, when I was in college, I uh, had my roommate and I, and we went to a church that got out at 11.30 in the morning because we started earlier than everybody else. And 
So we'd get back to the campus before everybody else. 1140 or so, we were back at, back at the campus. We changed clothes and cafeteria didn't open until noon. We'd go over. We had these two suite mates because we shared a, a, a bathroom in between. And when we came back at 1140 or so, my two suite mates who were ministerial students preparing for the careers in ministry, they'd be taking their showers. We'd hear them over there. And then we'd head to the cafeteria and those two rascals... They'd put on a coat and tie like they'd just come from church. And that's how they'd go to the cafeteria. Uh, they just want to keep up the appearance. That, it wasn't nearly as important to be obedient to God, to be faithful to God. Uh, they were playing a game. A lot of us play games. The gray hair of adultery is the second thing. Over and over again, Hosea likened God's people to unfaithful people, adulterers, spiritual adulterers. Instead of loving God with all their heart, they loved other things as well. And your God is whatever you look to for meaning, for purpose, for direction. What determines how you spend your money and how you spend your time, all that stuff. That's your God. And we have, we're idolaters at a high level, and idolaters are adulterers spiritually. Are we trying to love the, Lord, the world and the Lord? A lot of times. The gray hair third of prayerlessness. And that's in that verse 7 where he says, not one of them calls on my name. They're not even asking me for anything anymore. They're not looking to me for anything. They're going to manage it themselves. And that's a big part of the gray hairs. You're just not talking to God about anything. And, well, I'm really busy because I don't have time for pray, to pray. I'm, I'm not good at it, so I'm not going to do it. The best way to grow in prayer is to pray. The gray hair of worldliness. Uh, there in verse 8, mixes with the godless. And it's sad that a lot of Christians really don't look any different than the lost people around them. And I'm claiming to be a Christian, but my life is exactly the same as a guy who's far from God that's next to me. And in commitment, life choices, is not a discernible difference. The gray hair, fifth of unfruitful service. And this is, uh, just, there's nothing in my life that's, that's touching eternity. There's nothing in my life that... I'm doing good things, but I know a lot of lost people, people far from God, people who deny the word of God, the revelation of God through Jesus Christ, and they're doing good things here, there, and yon, but that's not the same thing as being obedient to God in the things eternal and where you're serving. What are you doing that's touching eternity in your service to God? Because, man, that's going to hit you. It's also going to hit your kids, your grandkids. Because there is a domino effect to this generationally. The gray hair of empty formalism. <laughs> the dove is a beautiful bird, verse 11. But a dove is easily deceived and senseless. It's a vain, silly bird. And I know a lot of vain, silly people. Profess to be Christians. Don't possess a new life. Again, just trying to look the part when needed. Seventh, the gray hair of rebellion. And this is the sin of just complaining about God. We question God's wisdom. We question God's ways. We question God's word. We become bitter when it doesn't work out the way we want to. And This is the gray hair of rebellion. We're blind to our own faults, but man, we could spot it in everybody else. I don't know how many times in my life I've heard that, well, I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, I'd rather have a hypocrite in church is hearing God's word and spending time with God's people. Be a hypocrite in the church than a hypocrite outside the church and just going to hell. Right? Yeah, we're full of hypocrites. We're a bunch of sinners just trying to lean into God. Hospital for sinners in here, not a museum for saints. Not sure what they think a church is supposed to be. That's not a biblical model. We do not like to admit failure and decline. But we love to point it out to everyone else. We do not look at the mirror enough. The mirror of God's word. The mirror of God's word, just like that mirror this morning told me. I'm an old guy now. The mirror of this book says, here's where you're, here's where you're missing the mark. Here's where you're falling short. Here's where you need, to, you need to pick up the pace and walk closer with me. And we feel to take the advice of others, whether it's God or godly people around us because we always think we know best and if someone says you're kind of going gray there's no accountability in most Christians lives nobody's asking questions that are important questions and we resent having anyone say anything like that to us the Bible says we are lost in our sin we can't save ourselves back to that grace word we talked about earlier we can't save ourselves from sin's power and sin's penalty 
And that's why uh, we get the word during the time of the divided kingdom when everything is so messed up and everything seems so hopeless, north and then south for this long period of time, then finally here comes this, this word. And it's, I love it in the prophets because it's simple and it's, it's a little reserved, but you start finding it and it's like in the background of so much hopelessness and brokenness, there is this steady drum beat and it just keeps getting louder and louder and louder because in these times the word of the Lord says prophet Isaiah for instance a child will be born to us a son will be given to us and the government will be on his shoulders and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty God eternal father the prince of peace the dominion will be vast its prosperity will never end and he will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish it. There's coming a day when a Savior will come. you got to read the whole Bible to find a lot of these little treasures. That one's going to be familiar to a lot of you. You've heard enough Christmas sermons to have come across that one. You've heard some songs. But there's one that, that may be my favorite. i got a lot of favorites in Isaiah, but there's one that just so touches my heart because it's it's so guttural and desperate. And it's just Isaiah calling out to God. And it's late in his life when he's done everything God told him to and everything's still sliding away from God. And here's what you get. Uh, you you want to you write this down, put it somewhere. Isaiah 64, 1. Isaiah 64, 1. And Isaiah, in desperation, because everything's so broken, he says, if, if only you would tear the heavens open, and come down. Oh God, if only he would just tear the heavens open and come down. And this is the story of Jesus. One day he did it. He did it. He tore the heavens open and he came down. And he showed us what faithfulness really looks like. And he showed us what a relationship to God could be like. And as the sinless son of God, he died on the cross and illustrated by the sacrifice of what Hosea did in his story to buy us back from slavery to sin and to take us home.